In 2012, Hank Willis Thompson saw a poster of Norman Rockwell's painting of a family seated around a holiday table with the matriarch presenting a turkey to her guests. For Mr. Thomas, a 42-year-old black artist raised in Manhattan, the pale complexions in Mr. Rockwell's 1943 masterpiece did little to represent his experience of a diverse America. So he decided to create a tableau of his own. Mr. Thomas and the photographer Emily Shore rented a home here in Los Angeles for a weekend. And then they shot several images that hearkened back to Mr. Rockwell's series, Freedom From Want. Rockwell's series of four paintings were inspired by President Franklin D. Roosevelt's 1941 speech to Congress celebrating America's freedom and democratic values. Rockwell's image haunted me because of the world we live in, the artist said, referring to today's divisive political climate. I wanted to imagine what it would look like today. The beginning of this article in the New York Times last year and the work of Mr. Thomas and Ms. Sewer created the perfect beginning point for our first summer series this year, Reimagining the Family Portrait. Mr. Thomas, interestingly, chose to shoot his series here in Los Angeles, a place filled with wonderful examples of the changing American family. Every day, you and I have the opportunity to see living family portraits that show us in real time how the structure and evolution of families is rapidly changing. In our church and in our city, we find in these new families an abundance of joy, even in times that are hard. It is a gift to watch the joy that emerges as diverse groups of people find ways to love and care for each other in traditional and non-traditional ways. The changing landscape of American families has led some writers and scholars to question if in fact the typical American family ever existed anywhere. But rather than seeing this as a frightening development, these researchers are expressing what they called unsullied astonishment at how rapidly the family has changed in recent years and is continuing to change. I have to tell you, I find this enormously hopeful. In the midst of the changing climate in our country, families are still becoming more socially egalitarian overall, even as economic disparities widen and forces in American life fight against this trend. Families today are more ethnically, racially, religiously, and stylistically diverse than they were half a generation ago or even half a year ago. The studies show that in increasing numbers, blacks are marrying whites, atheists do marry Baptist, men marry men, women marry women, and those who are queer marry anybody they want. Good friends join forces as part of the voluntary kin movement, sharing medical directives, wills, even adopting one another legally. The study also said that Democrats marry Republicans, which shows this study is three years old. <laughs> but more and more single people live alone today and proudly consider themselves families of one. They are often more generous and civic-minded than some other families. Bella DiPaolo, a professor of psychology, says, there are studies showing single people are more likely than married couples to be in touch with friends, neighbors, siblings, and parents. We are seeing more types of families and living arrangements than there used to be. And most of us will move through several different types 
over the course of our lives. Now, while many of us see this expanding understanding of the family as really good news, there are others who see it as the beginning of the end. We have all heard the fears that the breakdown of biblical marriage, which certain groups argue has been divinely ordained, is going to be the ruination of America. American fundamentalism has assumed that its views are the only views that are pro-family, and they believe that they must do everything in their power to uphold the biblical models of family. Perhaps it is time their assumptions were contested. Biblical scholars remind us that it is important to recognize the most common marriage pattern in the Bible is polygamy. It is not a union between one man and one woman. The Hebrew Bible is filled with interesting stories of marriage and families, but it is not filled with examples like the 1950s and 60s television shows. There is the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, the first biblical blended family. We'll talk about them next week. There's also the story, an entire narrative, in fact, of Joseph. And it is extremely interesting, beginning with his father Jacob, his wives and servants and brothers, and even some sisters thrown in for good measure. Hard times eventually brought this multi-generational family to Egypt, where they crossed a river in order to survive famine, and eventually became slaves to those in power. There is the story of Rahab, the prostitute, who ended up in the family tree of Jesus, and Ruth, the immigrant, who managed to be counted there as well. And then there, of course, is King David, a man after God's own heart, who had an affair with another man's wife and had the man killed to cover it up. He married the woman. They had a son named Solomon, who we are told was one of the wisest men to ever live, and who also just happened to have 700 wives and 300 concubines. The people in the Hebrew Bible did not look like the families on the Hallmark movie channels. Even in the New Testament, married life as we understand it is not presented as the model. The most prominent models of Christian life in the New Testament, Jesus and the Apostle Paul, were not married and neither had children. Paul explicitly ranked married life below being single. And when Jesus was asked about his own family, his reply was rather radical. Jesus said, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. But let's be clear, Jesus did not despise the family. He simply redefined it. In Barbara Brown Taylor's words, family for Jesus was not a matter of whose chromosomes you carry around inside of you, but in whose image you are created. On this basis, the early church developed a model of family that broke totally with ancient kinship patterns, monogamous or polygamous. The family that we see developing in the New Testament is religious and non-biological. The earliest story of family that we heard Lance and Brittany read this morning from the book of Genesis is one that begins the narratives of relationship. Our relationship with God and our relationships with each other turn out to be at the heart of all biblical narratives. The Apostle Paul, too, wrote about some family values when he penned a letter to the church in Galatia. He talked to them about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now those are biblical values that every family should embrace. 
In another letter, Paul talked about the type of love that is patient, kind, not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. He said this kind of love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And even when knowledge and human institutions fail, these values, Paul says, remain constant. Faith, hope, and love. And Paul concludes that the greatest of these is love. Societal definitions of marriage and family have changed and will continue to change over the course of history. What the Bible presents as the abiding standard is not based on biology or specific forms of legal contract, but on the quality of love that is shared. Sadly, some of our extremely religious siblings have forgotten that love. And they have forgotten we are all part of the human family. There are people who say that what is happening at our borders is about protecting American families. That is the me and mind mentality, which is eroding our moral conscience. We don't have to agree on immigration and border security to know that what we are doing to children and families is a sin. Nothing about the lack of humanity that is being perpetrated in these days has anything to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. And yet, I do see family values showing up in El Paso, on the Rio Grande, in Nogales, in McAllen. I see it in the parents who risk their lives to bring their children to safety. I see it in Los Angeles and Dallas and New York, Houston, Chicago, Seattle, and everywhere in between. I see it in the parents of dreamers who long for a life without fear for their children. We are surrounded by these new ideas of family and the beauty that comes when people are linked by love, marriage, adversity, and shared struggle is amazing. The God who is love has shown us. Love takes on flesh. Love interrupts harm. Love bears with. Love feeds, heals, and frees. Love proclaims. Love confronts corruption. Love listens. If we desire to practice the love of God and the love for one another, God has shown us what to do. And it is time for us to do what we know is right. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could take some new family portraits in the days to come? Portraits that were of families and children we helped survive the nightmare at our borders. Portraits of children having their basic needs met. Portraits of children being reunited with their families. In the days ahead, I hope we will all find a way to answer the call. And we will join others in our congregation and in our city who are stepping up to proclaim the new family values for all people. May it be so. May it be so for all of us. Amen.